Good morning, and thank you so much to the Napa Institute for this kind invitation. About a month ago, our longtime and beloved pastor was reassigned to an important role at our seminary. The weekend that he announced the news, there was a lot of tears from him and from the people. But not everyone was sad. The Monday after the news was shared, he was catching up with our parish receptionist, and he saw a man making a determined beeline from the church over to the parish office. This man was not a fan of our pastor, and the feeling was mutual. Before he even got through the door, the man said, is it true? Is he finally leaving? And our pastor sighed and said, it's true. The man said, well, I need to use your bathroom. So our pastor showed the man to the restroom. He went in, but no sooner than did he close the door that he came out again with two hands in his pockets. And he approached our pastor, and as if he was brandishing a weapon, he pulled out a piece of toilet paper, and he said, do you see this? This is the toilet paper you have for us in the church. And you see this? This is the toilet paper you have for yourself in the parish office. Do you think this is justice? Do you think this is right? Our pastor tried to explain to the man that, in fact, he did not procure the, the toilet paper. Um, but it was no use. So finally, Father decided to just acknowledge the unspoken truth between the two men. He said, you've never really liked me, have you? Nope. And as he walked him to the door, he said, well, now you can be rid of me. And then Father offered his last piece of pastoral guidance to his parishioner, suggesting that maybe the man should use the bathroom at his own house before he comes back to God's. <laughs> Our poor parish receptionist, who was the only witness to this event, will never be the same. I was a little nervous about telling you that story, and then I counted that Curtis Martin said the word poop three times yesterday. <laughs> and it made me feel a lot more comfortable. <laughs> but my friends, one of the reasons why the Napa Institute is so important is the degree to which it seeks to increase the intellectual rigor of our discourse, of our thought, of our formation in the faith. The video that was sent out before we came, uh, Tim and Father Spitzer and John, talked about how this is a conference that's preaching to the choir and that it's okay to build up the choir respectfully, I think they're wrong. Not, not about how important it is to build up the choir, but about who the choir really is, where they are, and how much more they need to be built up. You see, those of you in this room, I'm pretty sure you're not the choir. I think increasingly you might be the soloists. For the past 10 years, Catholic Leadership Institute has been conducting what might be the largest study of parish life in the world. Our survey just hit over 600,000 responses from over 3,000 parishes in over 70 dioceses, 22 different languages. It's primarily a study of those who say they are going to Mass weekly. To put that in context, that's about 17% of the 70 million uh, Catholics or people who at least nominally refer to themselves as Catholics in the United States. So it's a study of the choir, and the choir needs help. The mission terrain, or I loved Monsignor's language, the outpost, is right in front of us, is right next to us most Sundays. And they're not talking about sacred scripture. They're not talking about the importance of religious freedom or the dangers of gender dysphoria. They're not talking about a Eucharistic revival. They're certainly not talking about the beautiful gift of the Eucharist like Monsignor Shea. A lot of times, they're talking about toilet paper. My pastor's last encounter with his disgruntled parishioner may seem ridiculous, because it is, but it's also not as uncommon as you might think. And I think it's a microcosm for some of the cultural challenges that we face at the local level, at our parishes. This morning, I want to describe to you three dynamics that are play in the mission territory, three factors that I think are setting our parishes up for failure. 
Spoiler alert, Monsignor Shea's description of the church is much better. <laughs> but I think there are three things we need to know as committed and thoughtful Catholics because I think we can help the choir. The first dynamic at play is what I can only refer to as the compounding effects of our aging church, especially at our parishes. On Wednesday night in his homily, Archbishop Aquila beautifully talked about his Sicilian grandmother and the role that she had in teaching the faith. It was my Italian grandmother who taught me the faith as well. Um, she also taught me, was the first person to teach me how to drive at the age of 14. She lived close to our parish and I stayed with her a, a lot while my parents would travel. Uh, and one day she wanted to bring something to the rectory and she said, Danny, you're gonna drive me to church. And I said, Grandma, I'm in eighth grade. And that sounds a little dangerous. <laughs> but I'll never forget her response. She said, Danny, either one of us driving by ourselves right now would be pretty dangerous. But together we'll get there together and we'll be just fine. It's time for you to drive and me to teach. Now, I'm not sure the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Department of Motor Vehicles or the local police would have agreed with her, but we made it there and back just fine together. My friends, in no ways do I wanna suggest that older Catholics don't have a role to play in our parish, quite the opposite. We need them more than ever. In fact, if we didn't have them, our system of parish life would simply collapse. But what I do want to make sure of is, first and foremost, that we're trying to get everybody in the car, and secondly, that we're all sitting in the right seats. Right now, for many of our parishes, the majority of aspects of communal life are defined, driven by, and often fiercely defended by people who, actuarially speaking, probably have about 10 or 15 years left in this life. Now, if we were running the over 55 community that my grandmother lived in, that'd be pretty good. Or if our mission was only to care for those who are in their twilight, we might even be considered effective and fruitful. But that's not our only mission. Our mission is to gather as many people as possible to know the person of Jesus Christ, to have them be fed. And despite all the projections, countless surveys, depressing line chart after depressing line chart, Still, most of our parish cultures, schedules, practices, they still assume that as soon as people start having children, they're going to magically realize the need for the church and start molding their lives to fit our over 55 community of faith. What does this look like on a local level? Well, let's just take, for example, daily mass times. I've seen time and time again that a parish that offers a Wednesday night daily mass with confession beforehand pulls in young families, professionals, people who they don't see any other time. So why don't we make that slight change to the schedule? I recommend it everywhere I go, but the objection I get time and time again is that it would disrupt the normal schedule, the schedule everybody's used to. Who's everybody? Who's used to it? How long has it taken for our parishes to accept electronic donations? It literally required a global pan pandemic for most of them to get on board, and we still have a, ho a couple holdouts. Consider any committee at the parish or the diocese. How many people under age 50 are sitting around the table? I was helping a bishop and his team a couple months ago in a diocese, and I encouraged them, rather than just putting the token millennial on the committee, why not state a goal to have the committee primarily be people in the millennial generation? One of the vicars snickered and said, well, Dan, it, it's nice to get the young people involved, but we may, may need some adults in the room. <laughs> I'm a millennial. I, I shared that millennials were mostly in their 30s. Some of them are prime ministers and presidents of countries, and many of them are running their own successful businesses. I think we're gonna be okay. For the first time, the church is responsible for seven living generations at the same time. And yet, our allocation of resources and attention is still so lopsided to the older few. Why don't we invest more in the millennial generation or Gen Z? Time, effort, and money. People who are 55 and older have more fluidity in their calendar and in their wallets. 
They show up, and they show up consistently. So to engage a generation like the millennials, who have a reputation for being noncommittal and untraditional in their philanthropy, would pose a short-term operational and financial risk for a parish, a diocese, or an apostolate like mine. But failure to make space for them now, failure to pri prioritize time with them now, failure to cultivate successors intentionally, to allow them to drive even if they maybe are not quite ready, it's going to have a much deeper, longer-term consequence. The more local leadership only sees older people in the church, they can become cemented in a belief that young people don't seek God, that they won't respond to an invitation from the church. And while this narrative isn't without evidence, I don't believe it to be true. We know of the dramatic rise in the rates of anxiety and addiction and suicide. Sociologists have highlighted these generations, these younger generations, yearning for clarity, for authenticity, for purpose. What are we waiting for? These are cries for the church. These are cries for God. This is literally life or death. I can't tell you how often I hear in a room full of priests or lay leader, somebody will inevitably say the words, we have lost a generation. We have lost a generation. Listen to that language. Where did they all go? Did the rapture happen? How about we gave up on a generation? But I want you to look in this room. We're right here. We're right here. The church is so young. And the same intentional effort that Napa displays to bring all generations to this stage, to this community, it's the same courage our institutional need, church needs to display to invite younger people into roles of consequential leadership now. We need to invest in the intergenerational potential of our church to bring the fullness of our history and the promise of our future alive. And we need leaders who have the support and the freedom to take risks for the next generation. And that brings me to my second problematic dynamic in the mission territory. As laity and as a church, we continue to have a counterproductive over-reliance on our priests. Today in the United States, a parishioner is 11 times more likely to recommend their parish if they recommend their pastor. 11 times. They are four times more likely to say they are growing spiritually as a Catholic if they like their pastor. No pressure, fathers. It's unhealthy. Now, as a CEO of Catholic Leadership Institute, you're never going to hear me say that leadership doesn't matter. Nor are you going to hear me say that our priesthood should be relegated simply to sacramental ministry as important as it is. They were ordained to teach, to sanctify, and to govern. But my friends, what does it say about the roots of our discipleship that some of my fellow parishioners will not only stop coming to our parish, but will stop going to mass because our pastor was changed? The most important and urgent implication of this is these wild swings in viability and vitality of our parishes within months of a pastor change. We have seen parishes tank or be re resurrected in one to three years of a new pastor. That lack of stability creates a tension for the bishop throughout the diocese because the discussion goes from how many parishes do we need to how many capable pastors do I have? And as leaders, we need to be worried, yes, about people fleeing terrible pastors, but we also have to be as worried about people too zealously following charismatic ones. We need to be tethered to the ultimate pastor. Another implication of this over-reliance on our priests to be all things to all people is often a feedback vacuum that it creates. Most of the time, parishioners are still defaulting to whatever you want, Father, or that's yours to do, Father. As leaders, we need to cultivate that in-between space of authentic co-responsibility that I find too rare in my work. Clergy and laity need that middle way where we invest in each other, where we listen to each other, where we hold each other accountable in charity, 
and where we seek to help each other grow as leaders and disciples, not just execute tasks and events. This is especially true for our younger priests as they assume the mantle of pastor sooner and sooner. They're trying to lead in a very tumultuous landscape with very little feedback, very few mentors, everyone counting on them to make every move. Now this is of course a two-way street at Catholic Leadership Institute through coaching and training and accompaniment. We try to help our priests adopt not only the skill sets of leadership but the mindsets. The go-it-alone mentality that some have been formed with or hold on to is not only ineffective, it's not even possible in today's conditions. Our team at CLI tries to encourage these men to be vulnerable, to ask for help, and to cast a vision with their people. Over the last five years, we've used data science to look at the top behavioral attributes of top performing pastors. Across all of our priests, we see a tremendous skew toward an instinctive response to be conflict avoidant, risk averse, and continuation oriented. This makes it difficult, but not impossible for the average pastor to really try to change a culture. Our, our clergy, for the best reasons, want to tend to maintain harmony and stability, but ironically, their desire to mitigate risk, plus our over uh, deference and our um, lack of ownership only creates more instability. Among the top performing pastors, the behaviors that seem to be driving growth and vitality are a pastor's ability and willingness to take risks, to move decisively, and to cast a vision of hope and possibility, to talk about the church the way that Monsignor Shea has talked about the church. Are you hearing that in your parishes? Are you hearing that the victory has already been won? The Holy Father will say that the shepherd should smell like his sheep, but I always like to say that the sheep will sound like their shepherd. And if our pastors aren't casting that vision of abundance, our parishioners are very reluctant to make changes in their day-to-day -day activity or culture of the parish. Finally, with fewer men in the priesthood and increasing demands of ministry only rising, we see an increase in burnout and priests more at risk to fall into the trappings of an entitled clerical worldview, where the church should work around its priests as opposed to the priests serving the church. There's a young seminarian who I, I think the world of, and we often will get together and have conversations and ask each other questions, and I try to give him as candid and helpful responses as possible. And in our last conversation, he asked me, Dan, do you think that if I'm ordained, the church will be able to take care of me. Do you think the church will be able to take care of me? Fair question. I told him that I think he will be a fantastic priest, but I said my greatest hope was that he would be ordained never knowing the answer to that question. Because saints and martyrs aren't made by what they feel they're owed or need. They're defined by what they're willing to sacrifice. Which brings me to the last dynamic in the mission territory that I want to describe to you and I think we can help the choir with. We need to rebuild a call to sacrificial leadership amongst our clergy and our laity. We need a fundamental readjustment toward mission. According to our research, less than half of mass going Catholics, weekly mass going Catholics, believe in the teaching authority of the church. More than a third never go to confession, maybe one to two percent tithe, and yet we all want our paid youth ministers, we want our roofs to be fixed, we want our tuition to cost less. You and I know that the culture is dominated by a fixation on people exerting their freedom to do whatever they want or feel. However, rarely is that freedom informed by a sense of responsibility. And sadly, for many of our parishioners, their mindset around parish membership is grounded in a distorted view of their rights, what they're owed or entitled to what they deserve. Rarely at the local level are we grounded and driven by a sense of responsibility, by a sense of mission, especially the salvation of souls. Many of our parishes have evolved into some type of Catholic social club, where the expectations of members drive leadership's decisions, where mission is defined as keeping a few influ influential members happy. In our research, sharing the faith is rarely what an average mass goer would put in the top five priorities of their parish. Rarely makes the top five. 
Now, this has been a subtle reality for a long time, but we see in recent days even things like World Youth Day being described by church leaders explicitly as not opportunities to evangelize. If we aren't trying to evangelize young people at World Youth Day, what are we doing? If we are building, funding, rescuing schools, and we don't think we have a role in trying to facilitate a better relationship between the students and the ultimate teacher, what are we doing? If we're involved in healthcare and outreach to the poor, and we don't see it as primarily driven by our need to bring Christ into that suffering, then my friends, literally in the name of God, what are we doing? Our parishes, apostolates, ministries, and schools are means to an end. They are not ends in of themselves. And they are not means to stable employment, business opportunities, control, or influence. They are means to serve. They are means to worship. They are ways to the only way. The way, the truth, and the life. I want everybody to stand up. Go ahead, stand up. Everybody stand up. You've been sitting a long time. I want you to remain standing if you'd be willing to drive 15 minutes if that was the only way you could receive Jesus in the Eucharist. Stay standing. Okay, now stay standing if it meant you had to drive 30 minutes. Would you do it? Stay standing for 45 minutes if it meant you, that was the only way you could receive the Eucharist. Okay, how about an hour? Yeah, this is what I thought with this room. Have a seat. My friends, most of the choir would have sat down a long time ago. Most studies show about after 15 minutes. Our discipleship does not entitle us to a driving radius. It doesn't entitle us to a preferred pew or a subsidized education. No, our discipleship doesn't entitle us any, to anything other than a constant duty to give glory and praise to our God and to help others do the same. So what do we need to do now? How do we help the choir adjust its tune? Because nobody likes to listen to singing that's off key. You can ask my kids that. My friends, you might be the soloists, but a powerful soloist can move a lot of hearts. And I believe what we really need to do for the mission terrain is most of what we talked about yesterday in day one with our personal witness. We need to be leading with who Jesus is to us that the victory has already been won. How far will we drive for him and why? Why will we make that drive? As the landscape becomes more disruptive in the decade ahead, we have a tremendous opportunity to help steady our bishops and priests with our faithfulness. We must be, and friends, we may be, the only voice counseling them in charity, defending them in persecution, amplifying the good news they preach. These are good men who deserve quality feedback, who benefit from perspective, and from time to time who need to be reminded of who God ordained them to be. We need to turn down the heat of our discourse and raise the level of conversation at our parishes. We need to be people who move the conversation away from parish politics, away from parking lot complaint sessions about the pastors, to putting Christ at the center of our discourse. One of the principal ways the evil one steals us away from God is with division, is with anger, and is with scapegoating. Our knowledge and love of Christ should ground us. And it should also free us. It should free us to constantly discern when our hearts are becoming too calcified, when the sacrifices we have made for the church might start to make us resentful or entitled. It was at Napa a few years ago that a mentor of mine, Fran Meyer, who most of you know, shared some very valuable advice that I'll never forget. He said, I'm going to butcher it, Fran, but it said something to the effect of, I know that eventually I will see too many things to allow me to see new things. One of the things we can do is raise up other solo soloists to listen for their talent, to give them some pointers, and if God wills it, to take a step back and allow them some space on stage. We need to invite leaders in the next generation by name, and we need to impart our wisdom that God has blessed us with 
not to control or perpetuate our legacy, but to make our meager contribution to salvation history. I'm here today because of my grandmother, but I'm specifically here on this stage because of somebody who's really important in this room. Somebody who should be, could be on this stage. More than 30 years ago, Tim Flanagan founded Catholic Leadership Institute. Tim is successful, he's accomplished, he is smart and insightful, but those who know Tim love him for his humility. During each of our three decades as an apostolate, there were more than a few moments that would cause any founder, any leader, to hold the steering wheel tight and to try to maintain control. Not Tim. Tim's response is always faithfulness, is always humility, is always docility. Tim always invites others forward. And I can say certainly for myself, he invited me to drive before I thought I was ready. And he didn't jump out of the car while it was moving. <laughs> he slid over and he taught me. He teaches me. And he works his tail off. Tim, I am so blessed to be on this drive with you. <laughs> Monsignor Shea said that everybody quotes Matthew's gospel about the gates of hell, and of course I was going to do that, so. Um, but later in Matthew, he also makes us the promise that he will always be with us. My friends, starting with ourselves, we need to invite every member of the choir to ponder whether that promise is enough for us. Jesus never promised our parishes would always exist, never promised us a preferred mass time, and Lord knows, he didn't talk about toilet paper quality anywhere. Is it enough for us? How will others in the choir and others in the culture know that he is enough? Know that he is everything? I feel incredibly blessed to be in the company of so many tremendous soloists at this conference. With the voices that are assembled here, we have the great privilege to not only build a bigger choir, but a better one, a stronger one. We can build a choir whose song lifts the heads of our brothers and sisters from their despair, from their loneliness, from their anxiety, from their confusion, and that opens their ears and their hearts to the only voice they ever need to hear. It has been a joy and is a joy to be in that chorus with you and it's been an honor to share these days with you. Thank you so much.